We now have a release date for the final season of the best show on television. Better Call Saul Season 6 comes out April 18th. The only question is, are we ready? To make sure I was prepared, I rewatched seasons 1 through 5. Hell, I even rewatched Mr. Show, the 90s sketch comedy show that made Bob Odenkirk a legend. Part of the reason I love Better Call Saul so much when I almost only watch comedies is that despite the gripping drama and the profound characterization, the show is still hilarious. Odenkirk brings his stellar comedic chops to the show and sometimes even brings his ridiculous accents. Can you hold on a second? Uh, Clarence is going at the organ. He's... I'm going to step into the vestibule. Oh, there we go. Right now, I'm in Valdosta, Georgia, for the annual folk festival in Jelly Off. I'm supposed to be judging the art, etc. Uh, who are you? What do you want about? Come on. I did so much re-watching and re-analyzing of Better Call Saul in the last few months that my family had an intervention for me and begged me to split up my thoughts into multiple videos. So this is the first part in a four-part series on this elaborate and one-of-a-kind show. I think a therapist lens is helpful in looking at Better Call Saul because the show revolves around the question of the changeability of a person. Specifically, Saul or should I say Jimmy, or should I say Gene, or should I even say Charlie Hustle? Let's stick with Jimmy for now, Jimmy McGill, since that's his name for the majority of the first five seasons. In the flash-forward scenes that start each season, he's Gene Takovic, and there's quite a lot of Saul Goodman in there too, of course, but for the most part, he's Jimmy, so let's talk about Jimmy. Jimmy McGill was born in Cicero, Illinois, 15 minutes outside of Chicago, and not too far from where Bob Odenkirk is actually from, by the way, but Jimmy was born to parents Ruth and Willard McGill. The show takes place mostly in Albuquerque, New Mexico, though, and you may be wondering how Jimmy ended up there. Well, around 10 years before the bulk of the show's plot takes place, Jimmy had a life-changing event. He was arrested. We find out the details in spurts throughout the first season, like the flashback in the cold open of the third episode when Jimmy's brother Chuck visits him in prison. Chuck was already a respected lawyer then, and he helped his younger brother Jimmy get out of prison. Not happily or easily, he really took some serious convincing, and he also demanded Jimmy clean up his act if he was going to help him. It's a fascinating scene to watch after watching the whole series because you see the two intelligent brothers manipulating each other. First, Jimmy. When his jokes and charm doesn't work, he tries talking down about himself to get sympathy, but Chuck is well vaccinated against Jimmy's antics, so he takes his turn in manipulating by going, Guard? Wait. Chuck, wait. He doesn't want self-pity from his brother, he wants a firm commitment to change behavior. And he, I guess, gets it? Everything you're doing, everything you're involved with, that's over. <sighs> Just tell me what to do. Whatever it is, I'll do it. We learn in this scene that the brothers hadn't talked for five years, and that whatever crime Jimmy committed to get himself in prison involved property damage, assault charges, and a potential sex offender status. About that, he says, I'm not the lawyer here, okay, but it was a simple Chicago sunroof sex offender. That's not even remotely a... <laughs> Now in case we don't all know what a Chicago sunroof is, we get detailed insight into what it is in one of the best scenes in the series, the bingo scene in the final episode of the first season. This scene takes place about a decade after the flashback where Chuck helped get Jimmy out of prison, and Jimmy is by now a lawyer himself. In his work on a case related to an assisted living facility called Sandpiper, Jimmy the Charmer is leading the elder folks in a nice game of bingo. He's done it before and they always love having good old Jimmy there. He's even sporting a suit he got especially made to look like Matlock because his people skills go so deep that he knows how to woo the older people on a subconscious level. But he's at a vulnerable spot emotionally today. B as in... The trail. Throughout the first season of the show, he's done great work to build a case for these older folks who are getting ripped off by the Sandpiper facility, and after Jimmy is convinced to share the case with his brother's huge law firm, he expected he would get hired by the firm. But he doesn't, and it's because his brother Chuck, a partner at the firm, told them not to hire Jimmy. Jimmy figured this out at the end of the previous episode and confronted Chuck, who responded very frankly. Why were you working against me, Chuck? 
real lawyer. I'm what? You're not a real lawyer. University of American Samoa, for Christ's sake, an online course? What a joke. I worked my ass off to get where I am. And then we get this line. I know what you were, what you are. People don't change. You're Slippin' Jimmy. And Slippin' Jimmy I can handle just fine, but Slippin' Jimmy with a law degree is like a chimp with a machine gun. Slippin' Jimmy is Jimmy's old persona, known for slipping and falling in public to get money when he threatened to sue. And we'll talk more about that soon, especially in part two of this series. But importantly here, Chuck's expressing a lack of belief in the changeability of Jimmy. And the lights are off at Chuck's house because he's over a year into an electricity-related mental-slash-physical health issue, one that's required him to rely completely on his brother and others to help him while he tries to improve enough to go back to work at HHM, the high-powered law firm that gets the M in its name from him. In this scene, Jimmy swallows his brother's judgment and responds by telling Chuck he's no longer going to be the one to get him groceries or help him. All this is to explain what Jimmy is processing in the bingo scene. He's making puns and doing wordplay with the bingo balls that come out, but the problem is they just keep being b-balls. Like, I don't know how to say that. I'm not a big bingo person, but they're, you know, they're instead of I's and N's and G's and O's, they're all B's. Which doesn't really matter, but that twist from fate is the last thing he needs in that moment. It feels like the universe mocking him. B as in brother. Jimmy's getting stressed and we see the stress twist his usually sparkling entertainer persona. I'm gonna say is if it's another B, could have a real problem here. This bingo scene is the perfect encapsulation of why I love this show, and why if I had to describe the show in one word, it would be slow. This is literally a seven-minute monologue Bob Odenkirk performs, award-worthy, amazing slow tension as he unravels in sight of his clients. We see him suffering, unable to be his charismatic self, and falling apart. Be as in battleship, be as in bourbon, be as in Belize. Beautiful place. So I've heard. I would love to go there. But uh, let's face it, that's never going to happen. None of us is ever leaving this godforsaken wasteland. He digs himself deeper and deeper until he be for bursts after a few more bees. And what does he do when he bursts? He tells his story, a story we only get in detail this one time in this iconic dramatic scene that memorably colors the first season finale. Finale? 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 Is it finale? I, I guess it's finale. Let me know in the comments. One thing he shares is that he was previously married, an interesting detail I didn't remember until rewatching the show because I don't think it's mentioned at any other point in the first five seasons. He tells the older folks about Chicago sunroofing the man who slept with his ex-wife. Uh, quick question, who here knows what a Chicago sunroof is? Anybody? You sir? No? Okay. And he explains exactly what that means. I climbed up top and I may have defecated uh, through the sunroof. And it gets worse. I did not know that his children were in the back seat. There was a level of tint on the windows that I'll maintain to this day was not legal in an Illinois licensed vehicle. In his vulnerable state, he overshares without a sense of control. And that's where it all went off the rails. I've been paying for it ever since. That's why I'm here. His past comes bursting and bubbling up, and this legendary scene ends with a mic drop. Absurd as it may be, the Chicago sunroof thing was a defining turn in his life, leading him to go to jail, need his brother's help, and move to Albuquerque to work in the mailroom of his brother's company. And just like he's not at peace with the luck of the draw of seven or eight b-balls coming up in a row in bingo, he's not at peace with the forces both internal and external that have led him to where he is now. The rest of that fantastic season one finale, finale, final episode, shows Jimmy returning to Cicero, Illinois, and spending time with his best friend from his Slippin' Jimmy days, Marco. They run a bunch of scams on people, mostly for the fun, the bonding, and the nostalgia, not really for the money. 
This is the actual montage from the show. I haven't edited this at all. This show is the absolute master of montages. There are so many good examples. Soon enough, it's a very moving episode, though, as Marco passes away at the end of their week together, and we almost feel like a piece of Jimmy might be dying. So, whatever it was, did you get it out of your system? Yep, all gone. That's Kim Wexler, of course, on the phone, and she and Jimmy worked together about a decade ago in the mailroom at HHM, where she's a lawyer now. They also kind of dig each other romantically, though we don't see them get together really until season two. In that clip we just saw, Kim tells Jimmy that she's set up an interview for him at Davis & Maine, a law firm that's working with HHM on the Sandpiper case. Pretty quickly, only a few episodes into season two, Jimmy gets himself on thin ice at Davis and Maine for reasons we'll get into when we talk about his creativity and rock and roll attitude later in this series. But suffice it to say, his behavior results in Kim getting in trouble at HHM due to guilt by association. So she starts working extremely hard to earn back the approval of her boss, Howard. Kim is a high-performing person and thrives off of the feeling not just of achievement, but of recognition from an authority figure about her achievement. Whereas Jimmy breaks and bends the law to feel alive and to feel like a rock star, the times we see Kim color outside the lines, it's in service of her own priority of extremely high achievement. Like we see later in her work on the Mesa Verde case when she fraudulently submits a plan for the bank's expansion and risks her license in order to meet the unrealistic expectations of her client. Now, not to get off track, but I'll mention my interpretation of one reason Kim has this motivation. The cold open of season 5, episode 6, shows a flashback of Kim's mom coming late to pick her up from school and being intoxicated somewhat. Kim, as a child, refuses to get in the car with her mom. Her mom reacts really immaturely, and Kim walks home three miles with a cello. What I take from this, especially since it's one of the only things about her childhood we learn, is that Kim had to be the adult at times in her relationship with her mom. That flashback gave the impression that Kim might have had a justified lack of respect for her mom's authority. An authority figure is supposed to show up on time and sober, or at the very, very, very least, to be compassionate when called out for not being on time and sober. Her mom should have parked the car and called a taxi, and I'm not trying to cancel Kim's mom, I'm saying all this to say that I think sometimes when people don't respect the authority of a given authority figure, they seek other authority figures to impress instead. Let me know if you agree. It's very common to struggle in general with how you view yourself and to get help with your self-regard by outsourcing to perceived authorities. If I can impress them, then surely I'm good enough. But Howard can be a jerk, and Kim's getting punished for Jimmy's behavior, leading to her being at work so late that she actually runs into Chuck. How about some coffee? No, thank you. Would you mind making me some? Chuck is experimenting with trying to go into the office when no one's there so he can keep the lights off and doesn't have to trigger his electromagnetic issue thing. Sure. No sugar, um, just a splash of soy milk. I think we have it. Chuck can be very awkward and have difficulty relating to people when it's not strictly professional. But this is a fascinating scene between Chuck and Kim, and it's a personal conversation, not a professional one, even though it takes place at work and even though Kim starts by asking, Do I have a future at this firm? Chuck could not respond in a more personal and in a less professional way. We have a lot in common, you and I. My brother left you holding the bag makes you feel any better you're not the first person to go out on a limb for him i made the same mistake over and over again and now howard has and he blames you kim is clearly uncomfortable but taking in information as chuck launches into a story about his dad my dad our dad he was well the personification of good. I'm not sure he could even see sin in any form. Like he was born without the gene. He goes on to explain that he discovered Jimmy had stolen about $14,000 from the store over many years, but his father never believed him. Nope. Not his Jimmy. He ended up having to sell. Six months later, he was dead. 
At the funeral, no one cried harder than Jimmy. And now Chuck gets to the crux of the issue. He has a good heart. It's just... He can't help himself. And everyone's left picking up the pieces. The conversation ends right after, and as he leaves, Chuck goes back to professional mode, having expressed what he needed to express. I'll talk to Howard. Pour a little oil on troubled waters. You're being wasted down in Doc Review. Good job with Mesa Verde. His response to whether Kim has a future at the firm was to first explain to her a profoundly unethical behavior of Jimmy's, specifically a behavior from his adolescence to get across who Jimmy is. But is this who Jimmy is? Is Jimmy as a person still as unethical as he was at his worst? Kim doesn't know, and neither do we. And neither does Jimmy, honestly. A theme throughout the show is his insecurity about whether he's seen as a respectable person or a shady one. People tell me how they see me. You're the kind of lawyer guilty people hire. You're a third-rate huckster who'd sell your own mother's organs to get what you want. What it's worth, I think you're an asshole. We see Jimmy try to figure out who he is in the light of how other people respond to his behavior. I'm a lawyer, not a criminal. <laughs> how did you know that I would... Uh... Spill that coffee. <laughs> what the hell's that? What's <laughs> supposed to mean, huh? I'm on the up and up, okay? I will be good. Slipping Jimmy, he's back in Cicero, dead and buried. Okay. Especially, we see Jimmy hang on to Kim's respect like a life raft for his identity. I mean, you believe me, right? Yes. You don't believe me. Of course I do. Oh, Jesus, it's right there on your face. You think I'm some kind of lowlife, some kind of asshole. What? Kind of lawyer guilty people hire, right? Oh, Jimmy, that's You, you not... look at me and you see slipping Jimmy. I never said that. Yeah, but you thought it. Am I bad for you? That last question is one the show forces us to ask ourselves a number of times. Is Jimmy bad for Kim? To quickly answer yes to this is to insultingly strip Kim of agency and to miss the deep reasons for their connection. We're going to talk more about their relationship in part three of this series, and it's going to be a lot, so we'll save some of that. But anyway, answering yes that Jimmy is bad for Kim also makes the assumption that Jimmy can't change for the better, even though we've seen the good in how he's taken care of his incapacitated brother for over a year and how he's fought hard for those defrauded elder folks at Sandpiper. And a lot else. The next part in this series will be a video on the ethics of Better Call Saul, so let's put our morality calculators to the side for now and let's focus back in on Jimmy's insecurity about being seen as shady or unethical. Specifically, let's talk about how Jimmy responds to the shame of being perceived in this way. So even though Chuck made sure HHM didn't hire him, Jimmy got the that job Kim set him up with at Davis and Maine in Santa Fe. He comes back periodically for meetings at HHM since they're working on the Sandpiper case together, and he gets to live his goal of being a lawyer at HHM, even if not technically employed by HHM. At probably his second of these meetings, guess who shows up? They turn the lights off and collect everyone's phones just to make the big guy comfortable. And his entrance literally interrupts Jimmy, presenting the client outreach progress to the team. Chuck's entrance flusters Jimmy. Me, but after some tense awkwardness and with the help of a calming hand on his thigh from Kim, he collects himself and continues, successfully being not just charming, but professional. Afterwards, he asks Chuck why he came, and he says, To bear witness. Which is obviously pretty insulting, as if Jimmy being a lawyer is a spectacle to Chuck, or as if Jimmy needs to be supervised. Basically invalidating and not trusting Jimmy's independence. Jimmy then gets a call from someone you probably feel like I should have mentioned already, <laughs> Mike Ehrentraut. We'll be delving deep into Mr. Ehrentraut's mind in part two of this series, and we'll also talk about Nacho, Don't Worry, and Lalo. We have a lot more to cover, so subscribe and stuff. But anyways, in this episode, Mike's call with Jimmy goes like this. You're still morally flexible? 
If so, I might have a job for you. Where and when? Jimmy's moral flexibility is influenced by the way he's perceived as inadequate. When someone feels like they're never going to be seen as adequate by the people close to them, they feel like it's futile to try, so they end up often fulfilling the negative prophecy. If someone's going to think I'm a liar, no matter how hard I try to always be truthful, what's the point in being truthful? This is an unhealthy coping mechanism, of course, but it's one that many of us fall into when it takes a lot of effort to change our behavior and we don't feel like we're getting credit for that effort. Chuck acts wrongly towards his brother here, acts too much from a place of resentment and his own hurt, and projects too much of a negative image onto Jimmy, who responds by finding something that makes him feel effective and powerful, even if not strictly professional or responsible. Mike's call was a request for legal services, but legal services that go beyond the scope of normal legal practice, and services which are actually themselves illegal. Mike needs Jimmy to get the heat off of an associate of his, and to do this, Jimmy does something any good defense attorney should know how to do, which is so doubt. His client is a dorky drug dealer, Price, played by the amazing Mark Proch, one of the cutest and funniest side characters of the show, and the cops are correctly thinking that Price is worth investigating after he got robbed, called the police, and they realized he was almost definitely a drug dealer. Among other evidence, like his lifted Hummer, the cops saw a hidden compartment in his house. So to so doubt, Jimmy makes up a story about that hidden compartment and what it was actually for. We'll talk about this scene and its consequences, and then we'll finish up this part one in the series, and it'll be a nice full circle moment, because we talked earlier about a Chicago sunroof, and here we're introduced to something called the Hoboken Squat Cobbler. His way of naming things is so interesting, both here and with the Chicago sunroof thing, because it's him connecting a city with a noun to create a new concept for some taboo human behavior. But before we get to that, the first thing we should note about the scene is the amazing acting performance of Jimmy McGill, and no I don't mean Bob Odenkirk, though his acting is great too. Jimmy is performing this whole routine where he's getting the cops to feel like they're dragging the story out of him. He's acting very private and defensive. So, fully clothed, Mr. Wormall, by himself, doing what? Yeah, come on, man, what? Squat cobbler. If you didn't already know, a Hoboken squat cobbler is... It's when a man sits in pie. He sits in a pie. And he... He wiggles around. Then there's a great line where he adds, You got to be shitting this. Yeah, like I would make this up. The absurdity is the point, and he sows doubt by saying the hidden compartment was where Price kept these videos. And specifically, he adds to the doubt by adding disgust, completely grossing out the cops with the image of Price squatting and crying on a pie, since I guess the cops aren't kink positive. Anyway, I know lawyers are supposed to sow doubt like this for their client, and my sense is that to a significant extent they're allowed to explicitly lie while doing so. Even though I'm not sure I say that because later when Jim Jimmy tells Kim about it, she says, Wow. I've heard some far out scenarios used to sow doubt, but this definitely takes the cake. Kim. 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 Takes the pie. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> the problem for Kim, anyway, comes when Jimmy explains further. I think it was the video that clinched it. What video? Wait, wait, you, you actually made a video? I, I gotta say, in the end, old Dan really committed. Kim is really bothered, but Jimmy misunderstands why at first, and explains that the pie they're eating was nowhere near the set, it was an extra he bought. She clarifies, one thing I love about Kim's character is how direct she can be when she wants to. You fabricated evidence? I made a video. She goes on to ask, What if Davis and Maine find out you faked evidence? It wasn't a Davis and Maine client. It was some nothing little pro bono thing. It was off the clock, it was uh, totally my own thing. Why? This look he makes right here is priceless. The camera lingers and he closes and opens his mouth. Better Call Saul makes us reflect on how much meaning can be found in the why questions. It's something I noticed throughout the show. Why would I? Why would anyone make up a story like that? And the why is not your concern. Jimmy's why in this situation with Price and the pies is that he was doing it to help a friend, and Kim replies, Why would you risk the best job you've ever had for some pro bono case? 
She doesn't ask who the friend is, just tries to emphasize he's risking his career, and she comes back to the why question. If you get caught... They, they're never gonna find out. Seriously, you sound like every dumb criminal out there. If you keep this up, they will find out. For what, Jimmy? There's a 16 second pause here as he comes up with nothing and she finally just tells him she can't hear about this kind of stuff. Jimmy doesn't exactly seem willing or able to go into depth about why he's motivated to risk his professional well-being for a free favor to a friend, so they leave it at Kim telling him he can't tell her about this stuff. I cannot hear about this sort of thing. Ever again, okay? She settles for the far lesser prize of Jimmy not telling her his crimes because it seems like she has no chance of getting him to commit to preventing himself from taking these huge risks. Even in the safety of his most intimate relationship, Jimmy doesn't feel safe to capably reflect on his motivations. Imagine if instead of sitting there fumbling with his fork in the pie, he looked at Kim and said, Honestly, I feel like being involved in shady stuff makes me feel effective and powerful and special and independent and and really kim i don't have any other friends besides you and this older guy mike he's kind of like a friend and also i feel really cool when i interact with him because i'm getting in touch with a world that's outside of the professional one where i feel like i'll never be good enough and i'm never adequate well, if Jimmy said that, then it wouldn't be a good show, right? This is why I would make a terrible character on television. Anyway, I hope I did a good job of sort of like introducing my analysis to Better Call Saul and giving some taste and flavor for my understanding of, uh, what? Why did I phrase it that way? Am I hungry? I haven't eaten yet. Anyways, I hope I, you know, elaborated my perspective pretty well and maybe just like jogged people's brains a little bit and got everyone excited about this show. I've had a lot of fun compiling notes and putting together a script and stuff like that. And I'm really looking forward to coming up with the next few parts in this series. And then when season six comes out, I'm definitely going to have a lot more to say. I just, I didn't want to wait until season six because, well, a few reasons. One, I just, I'm working on it now. I wanted to keep working, but I also like, I don't want to just watch season six with like a video in mind. So I wanted to get a lot of my thoughts out of my system and also then be on the record saying what I say, you know, see if stuff in season six sort of fulfills it and then, you know, feel like a, a really smart person or something. But like, yeah, I didn't want to wait, but I'm probably going to have a lot more to say. Uh, I also, before season six comes out, I'm trying to say a lot more, as I've mentioned throughout this video, about the ethics, the relationships, and uh, maybe his sort of like creativity and rock star persona. So there's a lot more to come. I hope you enjoyed this, and I hope you enjoy whatever I come up with uh, subsequently. Check out the other videos on this channel. I got a lot of cool ones about movies and TV and other types of media and stuff like that. Um, there's also a lot of really cool videos and music on the Patreon. If you want to support the channel and these videos, you can pay a dollar or two every month and you get access to a bunch of extra videos and music that will never be posted anywhere else. And you can enjoy those and stuff like that. So that's pretty cool. Thank you so much to the five very cool people who currently support these videos on Patreon. Thank you to Put My Name in the Credits, Winky Face, Straw Man Productions, Elise, a very cool anonymous person, and another very super cool anonymous person. Um, so all of you, thank you so much for your support. It really means a lot to get financial support for art. I'm not trying to quit my day job. I, you know, I, I just, it really does mean a lot to get any money for creative work. Uh, I've been doing creative stuff for a long time and it really feels fulfilling to get paid for it. Also, if you like hanging out on Twitch, you don't have to give me money to do that. Um, you can just come hang out on Twitch. I'll put the link in the description. I play chess and talk and watch videos and stuff a few nights a week just to unwind and it's pretty fun. So come by. What the fuck? You hear that? Unbelievable. The government is trying to cancel my YouTube channel by flying planes when I'm trying to do my video. All right, so that about does it, and thanks for watching. Let me know in the comments what you thought of my perspective and what you maybe would like to see addressed in future videos about this wonderful, masterful series, Better Call Saul.
be more to it than that. There's not. 